Welcome back to Deep Thoughts, ladies and gentlemen. So I was talking to a friend of mine the other day for about four hours. One of the listeners that drives down to see me. And he's mentioned something brilliant that I think will spread far and wide for the way that we observe the world, potentially for the rest of your life, depending on how much we get, right? He was talking about cults. Because as a young man, he was fascinated with them, and that he was a very awake person as a person, later became awake as we say today. And he was saying that, you know, cults have a little thing that they do, and they want to pull you away from your family and friends and really isolate you. It's a big part of their game. I think, you know, it depends on if you've ever studied Jim Jones or or the, or the was it David Koresh kind of folks. And, you know, I, I will definitely say that, you know, these cults can get to a point where they're not evil and then they're, they're a threat to the government. There was something wrong with Waco because... You know, why were all these ETF agents all over this place? A lot of stuff said about what happened in that compound is probably propaganda just to make it palatable that Janet Reno went in and killed women and children. Jim Jones, you know, I wasn't there. Obviously, everyone decided to drink some Kool-Aid. The Hellbop Comet folks... Uh, what's the name of that cult? You know, they're guys with all the crazy shoes, and they also sort of took something and killed themselves. And you wonder how intelligent people get involved with these cults. There's plenty of cults out there that they want you to send them all your money, cash in all your assets, live on some compound with armed guards, and boy, if you just get out of line, they can kick you out, and because you've sold all your stuff, you're in trouble. But why isn't this episode called The Art of Culting, right? Why is it called Isolating the Truth? Because there's a little game there. There are definitely great ways to isolate the truth, and this is how we act as parents a lot of times when the world is crazy and you got little ones, you want to isolate them from all the bad stuff in the world, and hopefully within your family circle, you are bringing them truth. To the best of your ability, and you know, truth relative, but you know you get either your religious truth, or you might have your secular truth, or just um, unbiased truth. Maybe keep the door open for your kid's mind and say, "Well, you know, the current belief is this; it might change." Maybe you grow up and learn something about this, and you alter the theory, improve the theory, prove it wrong, prove it right. But you do it on your own methodology and you don't just read the book as the definition of the book, right? It's like looking up a definition of a word in the dictionary is not the word itself. It's a, using other words to further describe the one that you don't understand, right? A lot of scientific theory goes like that. Tons of biblical theory goes like that. So how does this apply to what's going on today? Well, we all know that the ability to say whatever we want to say uh, which has been a traditional hallmark of any free society, is all but gone in various sectors of communication. And part of it is what I keep warning you guys who haven't seen 1975 James Conn Rollerball. This was a society run by corporations. And it showed you a preview of what that world would be like. There were no nations anymore. Everything was a corporation. Now, I want you to think about that for a split second because you know that your country is supposed to protect your inalienable rights. They're not supposed to be rights that can be voted away, which is why America, in my personal historical knowledge, is the most perfect country to ever have existed, although today it is a remnant of what it was. It was founded on a republic, which meant that you got your rights simply because you existed as a being of God. No one was allowed to infringe on your inalienable rights, right? Now they can vote your life away. You know, again, I think it's Virginia. 
You could be a born human being. And just because the mother doesn't want to take responsibility for you, the hospital is going to kill the child. Simply because the mother doesn't want to take care of it when we got an infinite waiting list of people trying to adopt children. What sense does that make? It's completely backwards thinking. So your country is supposed to protect those sorts of things. And the state is not supposed to be allowed to supersede the republic with its basic laws. They can add more relative localized laws. Let's just say that uh, a state has not a single body of water of any size. And so they don't need any laws against lakes and how that works. There are certain states that probably don't have deer. And so you don't need to pass any ordinance about hunting deer and making them extinct. And so it makes sense that a state would have to prove that whatever additional codes that they pass are relative to something specific to that state. You shouldn't be able to, in my opinion, outlaw marijuana in one state and make it legal in another state. What, what, that doesn't make any sense to me. Marijuana exists in all 50 states. If you want that to be illegal, it's, it's not distinct to Texas. It's not distinct to California. But that's just my little opinion and not the subject of this episode. You know, several wise people have said, you know, you've got a republic, you know, if you can keep it. I just said that recently in an episode, and it's kind of been digging into my brain a little bit. The unfortunate nature of having your education usurped by corporations. Now, you might say, well, that's not true. The public schools are all government-controlled, all state-controlled. The problem is the government and the states don't write the textbooks. The textbooks are coming out of Europe, in most cases. Some centralized place that determines what is true and what is false. When scientific methods are actually the real methods, and which ones are hocus-pocus. Complete subject matter is negated, never addressed. You can graduate college in probably uh, electrical engineering and never be taught who Nikola Tesla is. Yet he invented everything that you're using to make your life happen on a daily basis, most specifically alternating current. Okay. Surrendering any strategic mental resource as well as physical resource to an outside country to determine, such as Barack Obama handing over the internet control of the United States to the European ICANN group, was blasphemy, was traitorous treasonistic. We should be able to control what we see on the internet. But now we have a bunch of companies that are restricting our capabilities to communicate. They are censoring information as fast as you post it sometimes. There are certain domains that if you go into Facebook and you just post brighteon.com, anything, they're going to immediately flash a message on you and say that that's not a domain that they allow. Okay. Facebook also hires outside agencies to handle various areas of fact-checking, right? But they'll actually hire agencies of corporations, such as pharmaceutical companies, are spinning off fact-checking companies that are obviously biased to their employer to tell you that the products that they make are fantastic in all cases. One thing that's very interesting is, is that You know, pharma, of which I've got an episode called Big Pharma. You might want to see my episodes on toxins, that sort of thing. Just go to health on deepthoughtsradio.com and have a little look, see what's on there. They have been unanimously demonized on all sides of of the political spectrum. Whether you're an extreme liberal or extreme conservative, everyone knows that Big Pharma ain't your friend. And all of a sudden now, they are greater than any God ever prophesized, any Savior that's ever supposed to come back. They are, I mean, our polarity on them is completely reversed in about 18 months, really about six months. Hmm. Amazing the power of corporations. So again, my prediction is within 30 to 40 years, Rollerball will be the future. And within about 100 years, THX 1138 will be your future the movies. Now, a lot of you will know that history repeats itself simply because people don't know it, right? That's the old saying. 
So if you do know just a sliver of history, the last hundred years of this planet, You'll be looking at today and going, oh my God, look at the playbook. It's just being played out like crazy. And what's fascinating about it is that right now I have parents coming to me, asking me questions about how to help their kids kind of get a quick perspective on things. I, I, in some cases, the show is good for them. In some cases, they think that's going to be too much. And so they're trying to figure out things to say to go, hey man, you know, uh, Forms of government like socialism uh, works on paper, but it never works in real life because, you know, Soviet Union proved it. The CCP has proven it. There's always a power structure at the top. There's always a capstone pyramid. So the only difference is they're selling them a false Robin Hood theory, which is, okay, capitalism's bad. Why is capitalism bad? Well, there's people at the top of corporations and they have all these... Uh, you know, nefarious, greedy algorithms that tear apart society. And it's like, okay, yeah, you're, you know, that can be correct. Again, capitalism is just having an idea you can't finance. And you need it more and more, either the faster you have ideas that you can't finance or you're unwilling to save because you have a short attention span, you're living in your telephone, which is a growing algorithm of all things, right? But when we look at the history of all, well, just we'll just use two, the USSR and the CCP. One is defunct and now capitalistic, and the other one is forever fighting capitalism within their country, right? Chinese citizens understand the benefit of and freedom and exhilaration of having an idea and getting it capitalized and making a company. And that still happens over there. But only to the degree it doesn't counteract and in introduce a doctrine against the CCP. Like Falun Gong, which is just a little exercise. They were totally for it in the year 2000, all the way up to about 2004. And then they realized, oh my gosh, this religion makes people love each other and, and value each other. They know the right from wrong. They understand suffering and benefit. So if there's any agenda to create suffering, even for other people, right? They're like, hey, we're not going to hurt our own citizens if we can help it, but we're really going to hurt other folks. We're going to steal things from people, steal their intellectual property. And then run a big, uh, you know, campaign, propaganda campaign that we're inventing all this stuff, but we're stealing it and stealing it and stealing it. Well, maybe somebody in the country who's into Falun Gong goes, well, that's just wrong. Which would be an interesting thing. It's sort of like giving a, an able-bodied person money as a homeless person instead of allowing them to get hungry and then the mother revention kicks in and then they actually find a job because they absolutely have to eat sort of thing. If someone who's stealing constantly to exist stops doing that and goes, okay guys, we got to get together. We got to get the best education. Books are free. The internet has all things on there. Uh, so let's just hunker down, figure out what would be cool to create that no one else has ever had and let's make it. The problem is Countries also have sort of this impatient, short attention span thing. What if China wanted to make Raptor engines instead of hiring Germany to do them as they have stole the bodies from the United States? They can't make the engines. All right, well, they need to get precision mechanics down. I mean, really, really massive precision. Well, if they stop to do it, it might take them five, ten years to figure it out. They don't want that to be the case, and maybe they are still doing it on the side. But how do these groups get so many people to follow them when they are clearly not beneficial to the people who are following them? This happens all the time. It's happening to all of our kids. They're getting indoctrinated away from their parents. Sometimes in just, a, you know, I still talk to my kid, but, you know, we don't agree anymore to all the way discommunicating their kids, which I think is actually a rite of passage in America, at least, you know, when I was, uh, gosh, probably in my whole twenties, I'm, I'm again, like I said, you know, long distance phone calls were definitely expensive. And if you came from the Midwest, you never spent the money on that. You just perceive that that was just a big no, no. And so, you know, we talk two or three times a year, maybe you see each other once a year on a vacation or a Christmas or a 4th of July or something. And that was normal. Today, we have so much free communication that if we don't hear from our kids all the time, we're just crapping all over us. Oh my God, what's something wrong? 
Now, if you can do it and it works, that's great. But the thing is, is that these organizations are suckering us into their paradigms and then sequestering away perspective, sequestering away other people's opinions to serve themselves. I saw a great post today. And it said, you know, what's interesting about the United States government, at least, I don't know about your country, but, uh, you know, they're giving away these drinks for free. The ones that they want to make compulsory, which they can't. They can't. They're, gonna, they're running PR like they can just to freak you out and to put pressure on you so that you go drink the drink. But technically, right now, in world history, they can't. There's, there's an international law that protects you. In the United States, there's a federal law that protects your body. Okay, so the narrative is that your government cares so much about you, they're going to give you a free drink. And this whole thing is to protect, protect, protect. But EpiPens cost a tremendous amount of money. Insulin costs a tremendous amount of money. So the same pharmaceutical companies that are so interested in your health, and they're just, they make you think that these companies are manufacturing this drink for free. They aren't. They're selling the living crap out of it. They're making record, record profits right now because this is becoming something that the, your taxpaying dollars are paying for. Technically, in the end, if the Georgia Guidestones have any validity in the next 10 years, you and I will have paid for the apocalypse. Isn't that wild? But again, if they really cared about you, then at least, at least the prescription drug prices would be cost, you know? And your taxpaying dollars might subsidize it, right? But then what would happen is, imagine you start subsidizing insulin to fight diabetes. But what causes diabetes? Well, the abuse of the human body. Uh, radio waves, right? Cell phone towers create diabetes by oscillating insulin during the insulin wrapping of sugar. It's like someone, again, hitting your elbow while you're trying to type on your phone. You don't hit it. Oh, well, here comes an insulin molecule trying to wrap itself around sugar. And there's a big vibrational signal coming in that wiggles it to the point it doesn't grab. You go into insulin shock and you go into a massive diabetes spell where you could pass out. So spare me any narrative that these organizations care about you. If they did, the world would be a different place. Go see my episode called If They Cared About You. But isolating the truth, again, is a very, very old technique. What have been the traditional you know, methodologies of doing this? Well, you know, before we had mass transit of any kind, before we even ro rode animals from point A to point B, we're on foot. Well, it's tough to build a society. It's easy today, but it was tough back in the day. We had to find all the resources, clean water, food, both vegetation, food, and livestock food. We had to learn how to build shelters, otherwise we wouldn't survive the elements. We wouldn't survive hot summers, cold winters, monsoons, hurricanes, tornadoes. We had to figure out ways to, to get through all these stages. And so we were pretty huddled together just to survive, just like every other pack animal species on planet earth so isolating truth in that particular primitive sense of the of the human history was just a natural process we are here and we believe this and this just works for us probably in a more primitive society it would simply be that which is true because no one's caring about upper intellectual thought processes we're simply going i am hungry now i'm eating i am dirty now i'm clean and you're trying to, you know, early man was trying to figure out cause and effect models of everything. But think about the theory of Santa Claus. Santa Claus is a very interesting little, you know, example for your brain. It has to do with the fact that your child from zero to school, depending on if you can have a chance of actually raising your child in your own household up until that point, right? No daycares because one of the parents is staying home. Very rare today, and how pathetic is that? You have your child isolated within your home, within reason. And you hatch these tooth fairies, Easter bunnies, Santa Clauses. You have some fun with it. Allows their mind to imagine. 
gives you an apparatus to make sure they behave. I mean, you know, there was no behavior attached to, uh, in America, to the tooth fairy. You just simply got your nickel, your quarter, your dollar, or whatever, if you lost a tooth. And it was there to sort of, sort of satiate the fear and pain of losing a tooth. It was a benefit model on the other side, which I think was funny. So we've done this. Religious institutions and religious families do this all the time. You're stuck in this household. You've got uh, praying rituals before food, maybe other rituals at home, reading psalms or something at a particular time of day. And then you all bundle up and go to at least Sunday Mass, maybe Sunday evening Mass, and then Wednesday Mass is another. Those are the three big ones in the United States of America for most Christian households that are doing more than just going once a week. And it can be a wonderful thing. Not all these things are bad. But what that does is it trains our minds to accept those sort of paradigms, right? You're good at what you do. So isolation of any belief system allows you to be allows you to switch from one whole belief system to another belief system almost overnight. There's so many families that have lost their kids to cults, at least temporarily. And of course, the family members are going, what did I do wrong? Well, obviously it's a relative term. You didn't do anything horribly wrong. But by having an isolated method of thinking, it taught the child there can be complete methodologies of believing, and they're brief, they're easy to learn, and they should explain everything and do all this other stuff. So when, say, let's say you pick a particular religion and you isolate your kids into it, and it works while they're children, but as they grow up and they branch out and the world starts to indoctrinate your child, all of a sudden all that starts to break down, or it becomes, in a lot of cases in the United States of America, inconvenient for the child. I don't want to behave. I want to do this stuff. I want to watch porn. I want to have sex before I'm married. I want to do all these things. So that paradigm of religious belief starts to crack. Because, you know, and I haven't really said this on any show, but there's a lot of things that are pitched as black and white rules in American Christian religion, especially. And I don't mean to pick on Christianity you can substitute your own family methodology for this. But one, they say, you know, this is just the way it works. There's no other way. And they just basically teach you rules, not necessarily bad rules. But the problem is they don't teach it with any fuzzy logic. They don't teach sort of the gradient between being in this household with isolated truth and the world that is completely a chaotic storm outside to say, okay, here's the thing, son. Uh, you're going to get into girls, and when you get into girls, there's going to be a lot of pressure on you. There's going to be, you know, sources outside, uh, even just on the internet, that are going to lure you away. And it's designed to lure you away. It's designed to make sure that your perception of a woman is so screwed up by the time you're ready to get married, you're going to have a very tough time finding a partner because the internet's going to say, there's always someone prettier out there. You should just dump this person once you're done using them like a disposable razor. And if she doesn't do all this freaky stuff that you've never even done before, she's not a keeper. Or the inverse. Wow, she does all this freaky stuff. She is a keeper because that's what you saw on the internet. And she can't cook. She'd be a horrible mother, horrible wife. And all this is inverse for girls to guys as well, of course. Without that little fuzzy logic education, I could definitely tell you in my own experience, meeting kids who are raised deeply inside the church, if they don't go back to Utah and live on their farms or whatever and have that isolation of truth be sustained their entire lifetime in a big Mormon community, it's going to be like that uh, Kingpin movie, right? Or what is it? Randy Quaid moved out of the uh, the the Amish community and becomes a championship bowler with uh, Woody Harrelson. Woody was a streetwise guy, had seen it all, done it all, and so there's this shock and awe. There's this culture shock. Well, culture shock is just another form of you know fight or flight. Your discernible ability to to keep oriented to whatever thoughts you have are very difficult. And you feel like the whole world lied to you. 
because a bunch of stuff was hidden from you. Which is why, you know, again, the, the most successful families in the churches that I've been, where they're actually sort of, you know, they behave at church and they maybe put on a persona that, you know, this is black and white, of course, oh, yeah, sure, it's all, that's all literal and black and white. But when they come home, they're like, you know, this is our, this is just some beautiful stories. It's got some good truth to it, you know, and this is kind of how you would play this to life, that to life, and so on. Now, there's also this interesting formula that's going on that, we don't always, I don't always hear it from other people, so I thought I would, re, you know, mention it here. Which is, have you ever been in a situation where someone is just hiding truth from you? Just long enough to get something done. A lot of times this gets really cute between couples, between parents and child. You know, it's your birthday, it's an anniversary, and you're hiding the celebration from them. And then, surprise, you know, happy birthday, that sort of thing. I had a surprise birthday party when I was 40 years old. My girlfriend had set this whole thing up. It was unbelievable. I fell for it the entire time. We drove up to my buddy Sid's place, and she's like, Hey, you'll sit, and Roger wants to have, want to have dinner with you on your 40th. Just be the four of us. And I was like, Oh, man, that'll be fantastic. And then it got kind of weird when I went into the house. Uh, you know, we got to, got to come downstairs. And I thought, Oh, well, maybe they have some, like, gift thing going on downstairs or something like that because, you know, you don't walk into his place and they're not right there in your face. You typically go downstairs. I mean, so anyway, I go around the corner and there is a whole room full of people and just people from my life that have never met each other. It was tremendous. You know, people I never even met that were just super creative. That's where I met all my Blizzard buddies. They just happened to show up because Sid's house is there, right? So that can be okay. But now take the same exact formula instead of someone who's trying to set up something wonderful for you. Well, maybe they're setting up something bad for you. So in this world, I think we've got profiteers. And boy, those are powerful, powerful folks. Because when you got billions of dollars moving around on a daily basis as a result of a drink regimen, and you, you know, they identify as a corporation. I mean, we know this for a fact that people have been murdered because they're against these drinks. There were little drinks in bars. Just remember that, right? They've been liquidated, murdered. All right. They're serious about keeping their business open, right? And what's interesting is that's just sort of an automated thing off to the side. Now, imagine a bunch of people are trying to pass some sort of new way to live around the world. A new economy, a new way to, you know, do the totalitarian tiptoe thing. Okay. Uh, that could be troublesome. But they're like, okay, we got all these partners. We're all going together on this whole thing, which is why this letter movement from, you know, the last three and a half years is becoming more laughable and laughable to me because I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, these people have trillions of dollars to fight anyone who's trying to resist. Give me a break that there's just going to be some thing that occurs that someone's going to nut up against these folks. I believe it less and less every single day. And believe me, I don't want to lose my faith in that situation because it was sort of like the either the second coming of Christ or it was going to be aliens landing and fixing everything. So, Again, I think it was a setup. I think the people that think that they were in charge and had everything figured out, they were played to believe that they had it all under control, right? All you had to do is keep feeding them positive thoughts or positive results. Oh, yeah, you got us. You got us, and we're so stupid. Why don't you tell your listeners, all your followers, that we're so stupid? That's the greatest, you know, uh, was Sin Tzu mistake you could possibly make is underestimating your enemy's capabilities. And the thing is, is when you've got folks that have real history, you know, we always say, look, you know, history repeats itself because of one generation, all it takes is one generation that doesn't know any history because they've sabotaged your educational process. And then here come all the old plays, playbooks, right out of the Nazis, man, boom, 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 no problem. That's what we're dealing with right now, aren't we? Okay, so these guys have the playbooks back as far as recorded history. They've got the real playbooks, the real ways that things went down, not all the bullshit revisionistic history that we deal with. And you think you're going to outsmart them? Mmm. 
I, I'll tell you the difference too. In case you guys are still skeptical and you're like, man, you're, you're just being, you know, unpatriotic and all this other stuff. Oh, okay. I'm a cowboy beyond your wildest dreams. Okay. So, um, let's just say you had this drop on your enemy. Man, they're royalty. They're financial royalty. They're royalty royalty. Plus, everyone is just rich and powerful. And you think you're going to take them all down. But you keep going to a podium. You keep going to a mic. And you're super cocky about it. So, well, we're going to wipe them out, you know. And you, and you post a bunch of stuff that's super cocky. Super ridiculous. Okay. I mean, I understand the need to sort of inform the people about what they, what might be coming so they have a little bit of, like, foundation not to be utterly shocked. I understand that. That makes sense. But if you really, really, really had the drop on those people, then I think you would be extremely humble and play stupid, wouldn't you? You don't want them to know you're on to them. You don't post that you're on to them. You don't post all this stuff somewhere and then identify it as being connected to the President of the United States. You go in as a rumor mill from somewhere. Maybe it's some independent person that could be played off as crazy. Oh, I know that dude was attacked in all the press because they were panicking. Oh, panicking, panic, panic, panic. Boom, boom, boom. Mm. In retrospect, I don't know if I saw any booms. You know, I don't think I ever thought I did in the first place. Tip top, tippy top was a pretty cool trick, but you know, that could have been just. Hey, sir, why don't you just say this? Again, they could be getting played just as hard as anybody's getting played, as we're getting played, right? What I think is interesting is, is that by looking at all this sort of limited amount of things we can say online within these corporations and people just going on Twitter every single day trying to be as profound as humanly possible and they're just saying the same shit every single fucking day. Citizens, famous people saying it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again and it's like, well, what, what does evil beget? Does evil beget good? Does hate beget love? I don't think so, right? And complaining to the people that are suffering and trying to drum up some sort of like consensus among the people. Eh. The problem with that is, is you don't have them isolated. The good people don't have anybody isolated. We might discuss things. We might come out of our little isolated, self-isolated shell. We might go into someone else's self-isolated shell. We might connect our two shells together. But in the end, you still got to go and stand somewhere to buy something or, or I eat lunch and I listen to the radio and my God, it's just full of fake commercials and all kinds of bad medical advice. So we're not in our own circle. We're in their circle 24-7. You know you can't turn on the TV and, and see the world that you are a part of. Yes, there's fringy sites that can pull it off, but I mean, no one's going any mass quantity do you realize that probably less than a single percent of Americans even know what Rumble.com is? I'm willing to bet less than a single percent of the population of this country knows what that domain is. All right. How much change are you going to get done? I'm afraid we're going to have to experience it, right? Now, there are, you know, events that happen around the world that are pretty encouraging. You know, and I don't know... <sighs> There was, a, there was a question that Russell Brand got asked, and you know I, I had a class with that dude once. He is utterly a brilliant human being, regardless if you uh, or he believes what you believe or you believe what his, he believes. It wasn't that kind of thing. It was a screenwriting class, but the dude's super brilliant. And he had just written his book, which had the revolution in its title. I think it might have been called Revolution. I can't remember. But they asked him, they said, you know, do you think protesting actually works? Like going out and marching in the streets? And his answer was very elaborate, but it basically came down to, no, I don't think that works. Not anymore. It was the only thing we had back when we used to do it in the 60s and what have you, uh, maybe the early 70s against the Vietnam War here in the United States. But it really doesn't work. 
And why anybody shows up to these things blows me away. Yeah, let people, I mean, there's looters and that's different. People are burning down buildings and stuff. But you know what? Uh, if your police won't protect you, then that's that's the problem, you know? Maybe the best way to do things today is to create a documentary of your own. Be clever. But now imagine you've got these corporations that are built up making billions of dollars. Some of them fraudulently doing it like Facebook with their fake users. And I'm sure they've got it, you know, abstracted away from direct corporate responsibility. No checks being written to some outside company that is creating those fake accounts and burning up ads with fake accounts so that they steal the money and there's nothing actually happening. But they'll be like, okay, uh, so-and-so's the investor on the board of directors. He's going to work out a, a, a beneficial deal so someone else gives them money and they'll get paid. But these places need money to operate up to a point. But we keep using them. We keep you. There's now the two or three search engines out there, DuckDuckGo and Brave.com. You don't ever have to use Google anymore. Oh, yeah, the algorithm's just a little bit better. But you don't have to use them. You don't have to give them any of your ad revenue. But people keep doing it and keep doing it. Well, I got my Gmail. Blah, blah, blah. A friend of mine uh, just lost, we think, he, I don't understand how this works, but posted all of the family photos and things on Facebook. Then pushed Facebook's buttons year after year after year to the point the account got banned. Completely banned. Shut off. No one could get to the site anymore. And there's being suspended where people can see your site but you can't post. This dude's banned. And now they're crying bloody murder because all those videos and whatever photos and stuff are not accessible anymore. Okay, well, look at what just happened. You didn't realize you were using free platforms and that you weren't following their rules? Hey, man, if that's the case, get all, you know, keep copies of everything. Don't just walk around with your whole life on your phone, man. The amount of people who have their whole life on their phone, all their kid photos and everything. And when I see someone who's at the lounge, right, and they'll go, oh, I got this great photo I want to show you. And then they're scrolling like 10,000 photographs. And I'm like, do you know how to plug this into your fucking computer? Because if any of that's important, it needs to be backed up. And it needs to be backed up on an external drive and your computer. I mean, you got to have copies of this stuff. Maybe send it off to one of those printing places and make your own photo album. But again, technic the technical capability of human beings is diminishing and diminishing by the second. No one even knows how to use the most brain-dead software. So when I have very little faith that there's going to be some gigantic rescue of this country. It's because of that. And those are the good people. The reason why I'm making these episodes that are a little counter rah-rah is that I don't think anyone is talking about this. You're either on the side that is going to go completely socialistic, blah, 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 or you're over on this movement side and you think that this this big rescue is going to happen which means you don't do anything because you're waiting for someone else to save the day when if we have to go through the eye of the freaking needle and do this the organic way who's talking about that there's things you got to do man there's things you got to do to go through this organic process and quite frankly it it sucks but maybe we don't survive it individually Especially, I mean, you could prepare your ass off, and I think it'll still be tough. Is college easy just because you got straight A's in uh, high school? No. It's everything in life that's worth anything is very difficult, which is why our forefathers said right after forming this country, you got a republic if you can keep it. They understood the toiling they went through, the near-death experience with the Queen of England. Or was it the king? I can't remember. So... You know, it's our turn. It's our turn. What's interesting about the two groups we have in this world, and it's sort of encouraging on one level, is that we've got a group of folks that believe strictly everything that they're told. I mean, at a level that's absurd, you know. And then we have a group of folks that have worked really, really hard to research what they currently believe to be true. But everything that they have in their truth pile is still very dynamic. 
Plus, we've redefined what we know as truth and pulled it back to the point of like, okay, okay. Well, you know, 20 years ago, come this September, there was an event that happened a long time ago, 20 years ago, and we don't know exactly what happened. We don't. And that's where we are. We have a little bit of relief that we were awake to that fact because now we have our little spidey senses out there. If any other new data comes in and we've got all the previous data to match it to, then we have a much better chance of interpreting the new information correctly. That's kind of cool. That's kind of where most people should be. You know, when people tell me about religious things being absolutely literally true, I'm always kind of like, Okay. I mean, how do you know that that's literally, well, I just have a feeling. That's what I always get is that statement. I just got a feeling. Well, um, okay. I know those can be very powerful and those feelings can be very genuine. And truth can be nothing more than a concept, a metaphor, an analogy, a way to live your life that works out in the end, right? Those are great qualities to have. You know, people, uh, you know, I've just got friends who are real, again, I've said this a couple times, I'm going to repeat this because it's something I'm chewing up right now, which is the rule mongers. Life is just for them. I just need to learn the rules. And then they get nervous about the rules. And so what they end up doing is running out and trying to impose the rules on other people. They will see someone reading a book, for instance, and it's about something that they know about and they've got other rules, like maybe even reading a Bible and they'll be like, oh, I'm in public. I see someone's reading the Bible. So I'm going to go over with my set of rules and weird things that are really not relevant whatsoever. Prince going on BET and saying, uh, or what was it? Uh, I think it was BT or the other talk show he went on, but he was all worried about whether or not Jesus was hung on a cross or a pole. Okay, that's what you're worried about? You're worried, like, you missed the point of the story, man, if you're worried about that crap. There's a bunch of names for Jesus, and and some people obsess on that, correcting you and all this other shit. And you're like, if that's what you're worried about, I guarantee you missed the fucking point of that story. But what is that? What are they trying to do? They're trying to one up you as being the expert on all things. Then you get the person who wants to split hairs forever and ever. They're like a fractal hair splitter, right? So they split the hair, then they split the two splits, and they split the two splits. And it's just, well, you know, you don't know what someone's this, and you don't know for sure, and all this other stuff. Well, it cer- cer- certainly sounds like you think you know everything, right? So the irony of these splitters is they're just as full of shit as anybody. Again, go take a poop and calm down, would you? We don't need any more of this technicality living, in my opinion. We're looking for super obtuse truths at this point because meticulous truths are just getting, they can be just disputed like crazy. We're losing, you know, what is it? The side, we're losing the side of the trail, you know, by getting too close to it or something, right? I'm going to repeat this analogy because I think it's important here as we try to hone our brain to figure things out. I give the analogy every once in a while about building B-52s back in World War II. Housewives were building these B-52s. Women who'd never worked a day in their lives uh, in, in a factory sense, right? But they built these planes so well that they're still around today and they still fly. These rivets were put in by women who are long, long gone, but they did such a good job. But they don't understand how a plane flies. So how were they able to build something that flies 100 years later, 80 years later, whatever, right? Okay. It's because the plans were made so brilliantly that if they just follow these little regiments, you know, you put the rivets in, you're going to be lifting the wing out of the press and getting it over to the point it gets riveted. You're going to take these complicated, you know, uh, machines that make up the cockpit and you're going to put them in. Just make sure these cables get plugged in first then put it in then put these two screws in. They compartmentalize things down such that the truth that they needed to know was 
basics, the basics of the concepts that they needed to do, but it built a machine that was amazing. They didn't have, they didn't put in a rivet and go, well, now, wait a minute. Why am I putting this rivet in here? Is this rivet part of what makes the thing fly? I said, I'm not going to put a rivet in if I don't know how it flies, right? No. Brilliant aviation experts built these things, boiled it all down so that anyone could help out, roughly, right? That's sort of how we need, in my opinion, to approach society to this today. General rules that simply work. But what I think is occurring is that the that beautiful truth, that beautiful simple truth that society has benefited from in every single country on this planet is now being kept from you. Truths about the human body, truths about whether or not certain species of corporations have been either a benefit or a hazard. Who is good and who is bad is being concealed. It's being rewritten. You're being isolated into tanks, into groups, into demographics. And they got a message for you if you're a woman or a man. They got a message for you if you're straight or gay. They got a message for you if you're young or old. Every decade, they've got a different category of messages you're going to hear. The way they talk to your kids is completely different than the way they talk to you. They know your threat assessment. The older you are, your threat assessment's less and less and less. You're a victim most of the time, the older that you get. This has been the case in history for a long, long time, but it's about to get really bad. I mean, it's already gotten really bad this year because of these drinks. It used to be that the older you were, the wiser you were. And that was true, in my opinion, because you had to have been a wise person to get old because the elements could kill you. My hometown saying 1870, you had to be wise to get old, avoid all of the hazards of life. Well, today in the lap of luxury, you are protected from all hazards in a big way. So it's no longer a one-to-one correlation. Plus, there are groups, obviously, that will cater to you the more that you swallow the pills that they give you, swallow the propaganda that they give you. Oh, well, you're one of us. Don't you feel better? You're one of us. You're isolated. You're isolated. You're isolated into the group they want you to be in. One of the benefits I have personally is having grown up making video games, both being the kid that played the video games and then growing up and continually as I got in, you know, from my, once I crossed over 25 years old, I started having to hit the 16-year-old, 16-year-old. Yeah, at 25, you can kind of have the mind of a 16-year-old. So it's 16, to, it's really 15 to 25. It's usually the main group that buys video games compulsively, right? Now that changed a little bit because the generations got older. They're definitely products for people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. Again, if you played World of Warcraft in your 30s, you're now in your 50s. All right. So as I live life, I and I write film and write film, when you write film, you got to hit all these demographics. And so you're thinking about, I think about the 12-year-old boy that I was when I saw Poltergeist and how I felt watching that and how it did freak me out. I didn't have any bad dreams, but it definitely was scary where I wanted to be scary, but not scary too much for my generation, right? It, It baffles me what kids get to see on Netflix these days. Just utterly blows my mind. The stuff that I would never let my child see. That's just like, oh yeah, we're just playing this and the kids and I are watching. I'm like, what is it? Um, That new gunpowder movie that's on Netflix. It's basically a movie about, hey mommy, let's, you know, let's go kill people. (laughs) It's just, whoa. It's good for adults. I mean, you can totally enjoy as adults. Got a great cast, pretty decent writing, way better than Black Widow, let me tell you. But what's also interesting is, is I'll talk to someone who's very intelligent and I'll hear the absolute sucker punch of indoctrination come out of them. They'll like a movie because of all this ridiculous reasons that make you want to puke. All the reasons that makes Hollywood suck today are the reasons why they love these films. And when you stop them after they say it and you reflect back what they said, you're thinking, and they'll, you'll, you'll hear them go on the phone or whatever. They'll go, oh, you're right. 
oh, oh, wow, yeah, oh, geez, maybe I should rethink this. And like, yeah, you should be really careful. So a lot of this, you know, cult isolation is always to create an environment where you feel empowered and smarter than everyone else because they make you feel like you got a, a secret. Yeah, it was Heaven's Gate cult. That was the one that was made the websites with the sneakers and the Hellbop comment, right? And again, I'll say this again. The weird thing about that story was that I remember, and I was totally asleep at the time. Every time I drove home to my house when the Hellbop was in the sky, it was right in the sky where my street brought me up to my house. It was really interesting. I got to see Haley's comment when I was a kid and Hellbop when I was older. But I heard a report that that leader guy, that nutty dude, survived somehow. Like they found him someplace else, but then I never heard it again. So someone must have been completely wrong because in this world he's, you know, pronounced dead with all of his followers. But again, that dude was super duper old, punching out. But he's taking a bunch of 20-year-old kids with him. People who had their whole life ahead of them. Well, imagine that. Why do cults succeed with these bullshit stories? About all kinds of weird stuff. Uh, what is it? The one guy in the Philippines keeps telling people he's got a treasure hidden away in the jungle that is so valuable that he can buy the whole world. He says he's royalty and he has all this fake paperwork and he has, you know, guys going to banks and muscle people out of their debts and but then immediately when they leave, the debts come back and then there's criminal charges. I mean, it's just crazy. But we know the people that join these things are just susceptible to it for a very specific reason. Because they feel completely lost. And they feel like the world has lied to them because either they didn't get any guidance at all or the guidance they got even out of perhaps formal religion. It just, it's idealistic, and life is not idealistic, is it? In most cases. So what if we were to identify this as a systemic problem? Well, if you raise a kid this way, they become very disenfranchised with life, and they feel upside down with everything. And if you raise them this way, they're very independent, they can think for themselves, and they can smell bullshit. And they don't fall for these things, which I think is the majority of folks. But there are cults of all kinds, right? I mean, we're seeing corporate cults now. Again, I don't know of any... I worked in pharma for two years at a very intense level. I definitely didn't get any sense that these corporations were perceived as good. Now, there are companies that have made drugs that have saved people's lives, I guess, in the perception of the client. Sometimes it's not the case. Sometimes it's just the condition they were suffering just naturally was, you know, eradicated. And, of course, they're going to thank everyone around them. And sometimes those people are legitimately the reasons why these people survived to see another day. We'll never know is the truth. I just don't know of any large group of people over a prolonged period of time that were willing to be isolated through anything. It tends to work itself out. They're isolated for a little while. Then they kind of start waking up. Because unless you're willing to say, and I think this is maybe one of the things that's coming up here, if you want to run a successful totalitarian country, you can never ever let your people rest. They always have to be suffering. Always. Because if you ever allow them to have luxury, luxury breeds a new breed of child that will have time on their hands to think, to experience things that, wasn't, that weren't intended for them to experience. Is that right? It wasn't intended for them to experience? You tell me. And so again, the old leaders die. No one can escape death. All right, so the old guys die off, the new ones come up, they want a different lifestyle. When we look at these crazy stories that talk about, you know, the Rosa Corey stuff, 
cities that are basically concentration camps. Sounds nuts, right? I mean, it sounds utterly crazy and, you know, physically just pulling that off physically seems impossible. What are you going to do? You're going to go to New York City and uh, what blow up all the tunnels or build big gates in front of them and then every single exit, water, land is all blocked off. Are you going to have a Navy constantly policing the place? I mean, you know, North Korea tries to do it, which is why I think these places are allowed to exist because it's an experiment to see if it can be done. I think North Korea is pretty successful at it. But then you look, that sounds absurd, but then you look at the goal. The absurd goal of controlling the world, the chaotic nature of the human condition. And you wonder, well, that's probably one of the only ways you could possibly do it. It'd be extremely expensive, directly proportional to the amount of people on this planet. Well, maybe there's an algorithm which is like, I guarantee you, my little hometown, which is a six mile square, that'd be pretty easy to fence in. Definitely wouldn't take a tremendous amount of people to to keep you in there. Again, if no one internally has any weaponry of any kind, what are you going to do? Dig a hole with a spoon to get out of the town? Good luck, man. Good luck. So a reduced population is definitely one of the ways that a bunch of miraculous things become possible. But the idea that they're going to reduce and you're going to be freer than you've ever been, mm -hmm. not likely unless it's completely organic, which at this point it is not. What I find fascinating with the drink is that in life, you know, I've got family members of mine who, who drank the drink, right? And, but they're against tattoos. And if you were to ask them, okay, why, why, why are you against tattoos? Well, it's forever, man. It's desecrating your body forever. Hmm. So you're, you're opposed to optional things being added to the body, especially when it's, uh, I guess, your body. That's fine. But you're against other people who make that choice. Now, again, if your 14-year-old came in and said, Dad, Mom, I want to put a tattoo on the side of my face because I saw some dude online that did it. Mike Tyson did I want to do it whatever, that, that kid on the internet. And you'd be like, no way. I know you want to do it right now, but you may not, you know, when you go for your first job interview, you may not want that on your face because it's going to show you probably had bad parents, you were not a good decision maker. Now, if you add that stuff later because you're a rock star, a rap star, an athlete, sure. Your total control of your domain. But guess what? There's a fraction of a fraction of a percent of people that ever reach that level of height. But today, turning your body into some sort of factory to make a poison that'll be in your body forever. Wow. That's easy. That's suddenly easy. And again, you take those people back two years and ask them about those same companies that are trying to get you to do that. And you'd hear a litany of, oh, man, I would never do that. I would never trust that organization, da, da, da. And now it's like they're just basically cowering down to peer pressure. And because they've been isolated into a false truth. And the, the whole thing about having to have approval from everyone else to exist, that's a super-duper weak mind. Super-duper weak mind. Why do a lot of psychosis happen in this world? It's because people are trying to replace what is missing inside them. You know, the anniversary of the moon mission just happened, uh, I guess technically yesterday. And I posted on my personal Facebook page that, uh, you know, 30 years ago, I was literally to the day, I mean, I mean, not to the day, but to this time of the year. That's when I bumped into the two NASA scientists who just laid it out for me, and they were upset that that was the truth. They were told, one of them at least was briefed or debriefed, that that's, that never occurred, that they tried, but they couldn't make it. Listed a bunch of reasons. I could barely process it. Ten years later, Bart, Sib Bart Sibrel made his movie, which echoed everything that they said. But I put in my little post that, you know, 
man usurps fiction to replace what is missing within man. But that's what we do. Well, I got everything else wrong. But, well, I'm part of that winning team, I guess, because, boy, look how many people are repeating what I'm repeating. Not a single person in the group has thought for themselves one day. No one's done any real research because they're in this bubble of a false truth. And if you were just to take it down to a, an analogy, perhaps in your grade school days, every single human being, I think, has probably had a teacher that wasn't as friendly as the other teachers. Some of us have had mean teachers, right? And even though they, you might have been able to avoid the wrath of that mean teacher, you watch that teacher you know, wreak hell on other people's lives, right? I had this teacher in fourth grade, boy, she was a, she loved the paddle. Anytime somebody acted up, boy, she would, but she went like way overboard. And I, I'll just recall the story for you so you can get a sense for what it was. There was a girl in the back of the room that was definitely, uh, I think, less financially endowed than the rest of us. We're all middle class, just normal kids. But there was definitely kind of a scruffy nature to her, and she was just less refined. She was a little kid, fourth grade. I can't remember how old that is. I think it's about, I guess it's nine years old. But I was a little young for my age going to school, unfortunately, so she might have been 10. Who knows? But she just wouldn't stop making noise. And the teacher did warn her a couple times, and there was the paddle on the wall back in the old days. And... The teachers could administer cap, you know, the capital punishment with a with a paddle. I mean, she could, they could beat the, beat your ass, right? So this girl wouldn't stop. So she got the paddle, dragged this little girl out into the the hallway, and we're hearing this. And when I, it scared the living shit out of all of us, man. As I think back, because every whack in my brain is sort of memorized, you know. I think she must have paddled this little girl, and it was hard, man. I don't know, 10 times? Way, way above what needed to occur. Now that I've been a parent, I know that a single paddle would have sent the message. Maybe even, well, probably needed the one, but this kid got just beaten to hell. And I don't remember the girl coming back to school. Uh, she probably did, but I just don't remember. I definitely know that that kid never made another peep in that class if she did come back into that class. So now imagine that this teacher continued being mean to you. And you may have been the one that got the paddle. And you may have done very little to, to deserve such a thing. But then all of a sudden that teacher is trying to make you do other things. Eat something, drink something, go somewhere, do something. Your suspicion should be pretty damn high because they've already done something bad. They've already gone, they've already demonstrated a lack of judgment. And they certainly have demonstrated that they have no remorse for pain being exerted on you. And I think that that little thing for me, I got this episode called uh, Playground Wisdom, and it's all about these little lessons that we learned on the playground. And I mention it all the time to my friends because my friends will mention this kind of stuff to me. And I'm like, yeah, I got an episode. It's called Playground Wisdom, and it's all about what you're talking about. So today we, we have, obviously, a command structure in the world from corporations all the way up to the tippy-tippy-top most powerful people in the world being defined as the people that, through money, can get anything to happen because there's always a sellout to do it. They're suddenly pretending like they care about you. And that's why I love that Ice Cube little segue in one of his first albums. He just had this, uh, I think it's, uh, actually it's No Vaseline. It's the intro to No Vaseline, Ice Cube's best song he ever wrote in his whole life. Here's what they think about you. Here's what they think about you. And he just keeps playing little excerpts from the radio. And, uh, He's right, you know, there you need to ask, here's what they think about you. Prior to them suddenly portraying themselves as caring about you, there was no care. 
But now they care about you all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. For me, you don't need to get into the sciences to fight this battle and to win it with somebody else. You just need to illustrate for them. If they cared about you, then why are all the other drugs costing a tremendous amount of money? Go to a hospital and buy an aspirin. When I was 14 years old and spent a week in the hospital because I got bronchial pneumonia and then didn't eat for about four days and then became mal malnutrition, plus I need to get over the ammonia. Pneumonia, excuse me. Uh, uh, one aspirin was eight and a half dollars in a little country town that nobody even knows exists. And that was 36 years ago, 37 years ago. I don't know what it costs today. You tell me. A hospital ride from my house to two blocks away is going to run anywhere from 700 bucks to a $10,000. And all they're going to do is transport me. Why, why initiate any, unless I'm dead on the ground or not breathing or something and they have to, you know, defibrillate me or something. If I'm just saying I feel absolutely horrible and I can't drive and I can't get in an Uber or whatever, uh, and I have no friends or family or anything, it's going to be seven hundred to ten thousand dollars to take a ride one block, not even a block, half a city block, a country block, a tenth of a mile. But they care about you, right? Ooh, they so care about you. Just replay that one in your head. Figure out a way to put that in your own words, and then spread that to anybody who's trying to get you to believe the truth that they've been isolated into. The faux reality that's been wrapped around them, this sub-matrix to the matrix. You know, this is sort of a weird analogy, but it demonstrates this sort of mother of invention which can catalyze original thought. And some people are really prone to it. You know, they have good families and good sort of like neural nets that get passed down genetically because their parents thought. And so they just have a denser neural net when they're born. Now, you can make one after you're born no matter what. But what was it? James Brown. He talked about the reason why he started his band. He said, I was broke, married with children. And he'd been playing music at the church, and he was kind of playing more funky music at the church. And he was starting to lose his invitation, as I think I understand it. He was losing his inv invitation because it was getting a little radical at the church. Can you imagine? If you go see Blues Brothers, you'll see James Brown at the church, man. It's amazing. But so he forms a band that can make it in the outside world, and then the rest is history, man. He became the godfather of soul, man. But he was forced to think. And I think a lot of us are being forced to think about things that we never thought about before. You know, luckily I got this show, forces me to think all the time. But I think the average folk is, is finding this new invention within themselves. And we as friends and family of individuals that are, that are coming out of this cocoon, they're coming out of this isolated truth. Remember the anxiety that maybe you have when you popped out of a paradigm for the very first time. It's Neo being pulled out of a little pod and going through the water and, and then the ship catching him. It's alarming. It's shocking. So we got to have, you know, a soft touch approach to the way we, you know, okay, man, you're all right. You're all right. You're good. You're good. You know, you're safe. That's, that's one thing I... Tell people who are in a panic situation, you know, you're good, you're safe, you're safe. You know, I don't lie to them. You know, if something's coming, we still got to deal with the crisis. But usually it's all in their head, right? You get a person who's too drunk or took too many drugs or whatever, and they're having a trip and reality's spinning and crazy, and they're seeing things that you can't see. You, you know, you can just say things, whatever you're seeing, that's not real. This room is actually empty. You're actually, okay, why don't we sit down right here and just stare at me, stare at me, stare at me. Everything's good. Everything's cool. Remember when we did that together at Have a Soup? Remember when we did this over here and that over there? And you get them to focus on nice things, right? As I keep saying, and I think this is really the name of the game, because I've got friends of mine that are they're fresh parents, and they're worried, and they're, they're very brilliant people. I said, look, first and foremost, you need to stay out of anything violent, okay? Don't go there. You need to stay inside the creative realm of intellectual thought. Look at the power of memes online. It's amazing what you can learn just reading a meme. It changes your life. It could just be a philosophical meme about how to live your life or how to process your past or how to plan for your future. 
Well, there's all kinds of political ones too. They kind of just, man, just it's worth four or five words are worth, you know, a four hour conversation. Get you to think. That's why they get banned sometimes, right? So anyway, let me know what you think. I think it's just super important that we keep this conversation moving forward in these sort of tumultuous areas because no one else is talking logically, in my opinion. They're just rah-rah on that direction, rah-rah on this direction. And a lot of folks are saying, sit on your hands. Or they're saying, write your congressman, which is a big waste of time. If you have the background and the ability to run for office and you're a good person, yeah, you should do that. You should. Just know as long as those machines are the same machines that process the last opportunity to change leadership, you probably are just making noise. So there's obviously some movements to try and audit that situation, but believe me, man, every step of the way, these processes are controlled by the people that committed the crime. And so good luck with that, you know. Again, waiting for some narrative or some... um, optic to come into fruition to do anything is just a bullshit excuse for having no control of the situation and no ability to do what they're saying. I assure you. Do I want it to be that way? Hell no. Do I want to see something biblical? Absolutely, man. And not in a bad way, you know. Unfortunately, the only biblical thing I see happening right now is uh, whoever read Revelations at the top is trying to make it all come true. So, if you haven't been to deepthoughtsradio.com, tonight I finally just updated the template to one that's very similar to the one you had before, but the thing works. And so, the news tab works, everything works, so it's good. that It must have been the other template, which is still being recommended online, just, just doesn't work. It just doesn't work at all, despite their greatest hopes. So, anyway, if you haven't been to the website, it's got everything, audio, video, Social media, all new remastered season one, a store. Be on the lookout for some new shirts as well coming up here. I've got some very simple ideas I'm going to push out there. So definitely give it a visit. Get yourself a Deep Thoughts Radio University shirt. We have had some uh, movement on the uh, store, so people are picking them up. So take a picture of yourself with something on. It'd be cool to see. Just send it to me privately. You don't have to show your face or anything. To all the Patreons and PayPal folks, thank you so much. We're growing over there, so I super appreciate it. Obviously, my dream would be to survive off that and create you guys super high-quality shows, lots of video, lots of pictures, and a lot of research on perhaps more fun topics. But right now, i got to work my butt off to get through this this rebirth of our economy, like most of you, most likely. But anyway, we'll get through it. So take care of yourself and someone else, and I'll see you in the next Deep Thoughts. Over now.